to go to a camp, to send out a video, to get a coach to know about you, it's never really too early. been a college coach since 1992. He has coached at several schools including Fairfield University, Holy Cross, and he is currently at Sacred Heart University. He is a 1991 graduate of Gettysburg College where he played football and baseball. He also holds a master's in sports administration. He is the author of several books including the Athletic Recruiting and Scholarship Guide which has been featured on Fox, ABC, and many radio stations around the country, including WFAN in New York. Coach Mazzoni has spoken at over 300 high schools on the recruiting process since 1998. Coach Mazzoni. Thank you. Thank you. You clap later. You clap later. Um, I just want to thank Mr. Pardalis for having me here. This is a lot of work. It's a nice turnout for this school for the first time. So that's a lot of work that he did. I know this was advertised in the paper and flyers went home. There's a nice little marquee in front of the school. And so I want to give him a round of applause for putting this together. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Um, you should have gotten three handouts. One is a one-page overview on the recruiting process. Another is a feedback form. I always like to get a feedback on what people think of my, of my talk. Uh, at the end, we'll collect those forms, we'll pick one out, and we'll give something away to the person, uh, the winner. And then another one is on the NCA Clearinghouse, which we'll cover as a piece of the recruiting process as we go through. Um, tonight, uh, for me, I do these talks about three or four a week, but we have a film crew in here to film tonight. I'll mention them a little bit later because they do sports filming as well. Um, as we go along, you can ask a question. Feel free. Don't be intimidated by the cameras. Just ask a question. Um, I'll take questions at the end as well. And if anyone feels uncomfortable talking to the full group and doesn't want to ask a question, I always stay around another half an hour if you want to ask me a personal question or something you don't feel like mentioning to the group. Okay, So uh, we'll answer questions as we go along and again at the end. Um, the reason, and hopefully you guys can see the overheads clearly enough from where you are, a lot of it's covered in that sheet that we handed out, but the reason I wrote a book, the reason I do these talks is right here. A while back, I was sitting in, you know, a high school athlete like you guys. I'm from Long Island. I played football and baseball. I thought I would get a lot of attention. I had great guidance counselor, great uh, athletic director, great parents, great coaches. And either no one knew what to do, or if they knew what to do, they didn't have the time to help me individually enough. Okay? And the idea of this talk in the next hour is to give you guys as athletes and as parents the information so that you don't need to sit back and wait for other people to help you. You'll be able to know what to do for yourselves. Okay? But the other piece of it, I've been recruiting about 14 years, and you might think from your side that coaches are everywhere covering all the athletes that are playing a particular sport and that if they don't contact you, they just didn't, they don't want you. And I've listed up here a variety of reasons why many kids will get overlooked. And now, if you're at this high school, if you're at New Fairfield, you play basketball and you're 6'10", and you have some skills, everybody will know about you. But if you're an average player good enough to play in college but not a superstar, you may be overlooked because there's a ton of athletes in your particular sport across the country. College coaches have limited staff to recruit, limited time, limited budgets. There's a variety of NCAA rules we have to follow in terms of recruiting. Our season is your season. Okay? The college coaches are coaching football now. They're not leaving their football games at the college level to come to New Fairfield to look for football players. Okay? Um, the big reason that I put up there is number of players. I coach baseball at Sacred Heart. There's myself and two other coaches that do the recruiting. So three of us are recruiting. Would anyone like to guess how many high school baseball players there are in the country? This is the interactive portion of the program, everybody. So I mean, <laughs> thousand. I mean, give me a number. Huh? Hundred thousand. Anyone else with a guess? Five hundred thousand. There's 1.2 million. Okay? 
Is it possible for three of us to look through that many baseball players? It's not possible. If you're here in New Fairfield and you'd love to play at Johns Hopkins lacrosse, my guess is that Johns Hopkins lacrosse coach is not hanging out in New Fairfield looking for players all the time. They may find you in some ways, but they may not be on in your high school games to be able to find you, okay? So what I'm trying to teach you in this next hour will hopefully lead to these goals. The goal, number one, is to keep playing your sport. I played college sports. It's fantastic. But only 8% do. This is an NCAA statistic. 8% are good enough and go from high school to college. 92%, their last play is in high school, okay? Number two would be if you're good enough to use your sport to get into a college, maybe a better college than you would have been able to get into without the sport, and pay for it. Okay, hopefully get some scholarship money or better financial aid package. And then find the right school. This is important to understand, especially for you athletes who think, you know, your, your college career is going to be four years. The reality is that 25%, so one out of every four kids that goes to Quinnipiac to play soccer, one out of every four plays four years, three out of four will drop out of the sport. Why might that be? Not playing time. Not playing. Not getting enough playing time. Academics, not good enough, they get out recruited, they get cut by getting replaced by somebody better, uh, not having any fun, they get hurt, their girlfriend doesn't want them to play, their boyfriend doesn't want them to play, they want to get a job, and that's reality. And if you go to a college website in your particular sport and look at the number of seniors on the team compared to the number of freshmen, you realize that that's reality. And that means you want to pick the right school. You want to find a school that's perfect for you as an athlete and student, not just you go there because the coach shows you a lot of interest, okay? And we're going to go through about eight steps, and we're going to start off right where I just left off. This is the easiest of the steps. This information on this one, you could find out from a guidance counselor, collegeboard.com. You can buy one of these four-year college guides. And what you're trying to do, ninth grader, 10th grader, 11th grader, if you're a senior, I hope you have done this already, is you're trying to narrow down a list of workable number of schools. There's 3,500 colleges in the United States, okay? It's not possible for you to get 3,500 college uh, soccer coaches to know who you are, okay? So what you're trying to do is narrow down the list. So nor normally I pick somebody out of the audience, and I did this last night. I'm just going to use that person as an example. Um, the kid said to me, Northeast. I'd like to go to school in the Northeast. We shrank it down from 3,500 colleges to about 600. He said, I want to major in engineering. That shrank it down to about 80. I said, how about the size? He said, from five to 8,000. That shrank the list down to about 40. And then I, I didn't ask him, but I said, now what you could do is take what your GPA is and your SAT score and find a list of schools that make sense for you academically, okay? And if you can't do this, if you're in 10th grade or you're a parent of a 10th grader and they have no clue about schools, the best thing you can do just drive, drive an hour radius from here and hit the colleges in the area. Western Connecticut, Fairfield, Quinnipiac, Yukon, Pace, Manhattan, Iona. You may not want to go to those schools, but if you say to a kid who's never been on a college campus, would you like a big school or a small school? They don't know. You send them to Yukon and they go, man, I love all the action here. This is great. They like a big school. If they go to UConn and go, you know what, I've got to take a 20-minute shuttle to my next class. I don't even know how to get to my next class. They're not going to like a big school. So that's the way to get kids to start narrowing down what they like. You've got to get them on some college campuses. Okay? But the point is to start the first part of this as if you don't play a sport. Try to narrow down the list of schools as if you don't play a sport. So if you do break your leg, you do get cut sophomore year at school, you're not playing soccer anymore, you still love the school, you'll, it's the perfect fit for you. Okay? And again, you can get this kind of feedback from a guidance counselor or many websites that help you select schools or books that are out there on that topic. Okay? I'm not going to get any further on this one other than to say you have to start here and if you don't, you may wind up being very unhappy with your college choice. Okay? The next piece, which is really the meat of the program where we get into is now, is how good are you at your sport? Very hard to figure out. I went to Gettysburg College, Division Three, and I was an average athlete at Gettysburg College. To this day, my dad thinks I was one of the greatest high school players of all time. <laughs> he really, he thinks I should have went to Notre Dame on a full ride for football and baseball and I was the greatest athlete ever. And he thought that because I'm from Long Island and he, and he saw me play 10 football games and he said, you're pretty good. 
and you know I, I was pretty good against that competition. That doesn't take into account the football players from Texas and Florida and California, where at birth they're ready 300 pounds and they they just lift weights and they they try to make it to the NFL. They don't have hobbies like we do, like skiing and studying and stuff like that. They just want to be NFL players. Okay, so. You might be one of the better players at New Fairfield, and your parents might think you're one of the better players in Connecticut, and you might be, and you also might not be good enough to make any Division III program anywhere. Okay? So you have to go about this much more than just trusting just your parents and yourself. And I've come up with a variety of different ways, so we'll go through some of them. You're crazy if you don't, if you don't ask your high school coach. Got to ask your high school coach. Summer league coach, travel coach, private lessons, any coach that interacts with you, you have to ask them. Okay, That's your first line of defense, so to speak. You have to ask the people that are with you on a regular basis. If possible, if you have the opportunity to have a college coach see you play, whether they come to a tournament, they come to a high school, you go to one of these camps, that's great. A lot of these camps are set up to give you feedback on how good you are. They will evaluate you. You're Division I, here's why. You're Division II, here's why. You're Division Three. If you want to be Division I, here's the things you need to do better. They'll give you a written report on your talent level. I mean, that's invaluable. You might be disappointed. You might have gone to this camp thinking you're a high-level Division I player. You find out that six coaches think you're Division Three. You could either ex you know, ignore them and try to go for Division I school anyway and probably get cut, or you can get motivated by what they say and get better. Okay? The other benefit of these camps, and I'm sure you're all familiar with camps in your particular sport, or tournaments or showcases, is that now you're not around 10 kids on a basketball team at New Fairfield. Now you're around 200 kids from Northeast and Mid-Atlantic that are serious about playing college basketball, and now you can get a better idea of where you fit in against this bigger recruiting pool. And many kids realize they're actually better than they thought they were, and some just the opposite. They realize that they have a lot of work to do because these other kids that are trying to play in college are really talented. Okay? Um, friends playing in college. If somebody went to New Fairfield and graduated last year, year before, now plays at Central Connecticut, and they play field hockey, they know what New Fairfield field hockey is like. They know what you're like because they've played with you, and now they're playing at the Division I level. You would be making a major mistake if you don't ask a peer, a friend, what they think of your talent level as it compares to where they're playing. Okay? Um, watch the colleges play. It's the number one thing people don't do. Uh, on TV is football and basketball of the big time sports are on TV. I mean now college sports television, ESPNU, it's a little bit more where other teams are getting on TV but if that person, the field hockey player I gave an example to, says you know I want to know what Division Three field hockey is like. It's not going to be on ABC. Okay, Get in your car and watch Western Connecticut practice or play. Go watch Pace Division II play. Go watch University of New Haven Division II play. Go watch Fairfield University mid-level Division I play. Go watch UConn. With your own eyes, you'll be able to evaluate, can I play at that level that I'm watching? I mean, it's, it's the thing people don't do. I don't know why. Maybe they don't feel like it's their right to go watch these colleges play. You're allowed to go pull up and watch a practice or game anytime you want. Okay, so this is something that people don't do that you really should take advantage of. Okay? Um, people that play in an individual sport, are there any swimmers, track and field, golfers? Okay. This is a lot easier to figure out how good you are because most of your sports we're talking about, individual sports have a time. If you run the mile and you run the mile in five minutes and ten seconds, you're a Division Three miler. If you run the mile in four and a half minutes, you're a Division Two miler. And if you run the mile in four minutes and fifteen seconds, you're a Division One miler. And you can just go to the college website and see what their runners do, see what their swimmers do, see what the golfers shoot. Okay, The mile is the mile. Unless you're running the mile up the hill here, which is a pretty steep hill, the mile's the mile. Okay, Unless the pool has waves, the pool's the pool. Okay? You can't tell a college football coach, well, I made 50 tackles here at the, uh, on the new Fairfield team last season. No one cares. They don't know what style of defense, how you made the tackles. They don't know if the statistics are right. Well, I made all county. They don't care. I'm a team captain. They don't care. I'm MVP of the team. They don't care. Okay? And we'll talk what you'll have to do to make them care. But in a team sport, I mean, I coach baseball. A kid from New Hampshire will send me his resume and say, I hit 650. And then I investigate that he hit 650, which is an unbelievable average, and I find out he played four games because 16 of them got snowed out. 
You know? And a kid in uh, Georgia sends me information and he hit only 275 against unbelievable competition. Okay? The numbers are irrelevant in team sports. Okay? Um, and what you're trying to do, and this takes a while, this takes weeks, months, it could take up to two years to find out really what the right level is for you. And if you go through it, let's say, let's take lacrosse. You've determined you are probably a Division II lacrosse player because that's what your high school coach says, your travel coach agrees with that, and you went to a particular camp and they graded you out as a Division II lacrosse player. Now you take a list of schools that you had from the beginning in your area, they have your major, it's the right size, they match up academically, and now you find out, all right, who has Division II lacrosse? Who has lower, lower level Division I lacrosse I could probably play at? Who's got powerhouse Division III lacrosse? And that's the five, six, seven, ten, fifteen schools that are the perfect schools for you. Okay? It's like looking for a job. You don't say, well, I'll, do it. I'll work anywhere in the country doing anything. No, you say, I'd like to work in this area doing this particular skill, and then you do a job search. Okay? It's the same way in the recruiting process. So when a coach brings you into his office and says, what makes you interested in Stonehill College, Division II program, fantastic school? And you're able to say, well, I think, first of all, you guys have a tremendous engineering program. I always wanted to be somewhere near Boston. I have family up here. My academics match up. I know you guys finished third in the Northeast 10 Conference last year. You graduated three midfielders. Uh, I really think I could play here because a couple of coaches know my talent level in Stonehill and this is why I'm really interested in the program. That blows a college coach away. As opposed to what I get all the time is, you know, what makes you interested in Stonehill? And they, the kid says, uh, mom drove me. Like they have no idea why they're there. That's not going to, college coaches coach college over high school for one main reason. Well, two. Number one, we don't deal with parents. Sorry, parents. And number two is, we get to pick our own players. So if somebody needs a goalie, and they're looking between five goalies to get one, and, they have a, and they're all equally talented, and one's a bore in the, interview, in the recruiting process, and the other one is interesting and excited, that's the one you go with. Coach, you've got to spend four years, sometimes five years, almost every day with somebody, practicing games, films, study hall, strength and conditioning. You want to be with people you like. Okay? So... A lot of this can be related back to the recruit, excuse me, to the job search process, where when you're going for an interview to get a job and they say, "Do you have any questions?" or you know, "You show your interest in the company." Okay, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, I put up on the on my slide there the movie Rudy. Raise your hand if you saw that movie Rudy. Raise, if you cried during Rudy, raise your hand. Okay, I, I cried. I mean, you know. And it's a great story because it's a true story about this kid has a dream of playing at Notre Dame. He goes through all these obstacles to get on the team and he plays basically one play. The last play of his senior year, he goes in, he gets a sack, they lift him up the credits roll and everyone starts crying. I mean, it's a great story. In reality, if I was Rudy's high school coach or his counselor or his parent, I would have said, Rudy, Gettysburg College would have been nice. He would have actually played during your four years. Okay. So if you do this the right way, you find a school you can play. A little bit as a freshman, a lot as a sophomore, start as a junior, team leader as a senior. I mean, if someone's out here saying, I just want to go to Syracuse for lacrosse, and if you're barely good enough to make the team and you're never going to play, but you just want to be on a Syracuse lacrosse team, okay, I'm, I'm not here to tell you you shouldn't do that, but maybe you could have gone to... Um, Haverford College, a great you know, academic school outside of Philadelphia, and been a great player there and played all the time. Okay? Um, one of the things that, that I think you can find that will be helpful, I put it up there, is this CD that's not mine. I have some books that are mine. This is not mine. This is the greatest thing i found to give parents and kids direction on the process. It's a CD-ROM. It's interactive. It updates itself constantly in terms of coaching changes, and it has every NCAA sport, male and female. And it allows a kid to put in Here's my GPA. Here's my SATs. This is what I might want to study. This is the part of the country I might want to go in. Public school, private school, the size, and your sport information. And it spits out a list of schools. It ranks them academically. It ranks them athletically. It gives you the website, the coach's private phone number, private email, and then literally helps you track every phone call, email, text message, um, visit, everything. It's a way to manage the process, and it's, it's tremendously helpful. And that this used to be in a book form, 
not by this company, by another company, and then it was always outdated because it's, you know, a lot of changes. This is now on CD, and I think it's, it's very, very helpful. I get great feedback on that, okay? Um, for people that don't realize this, there is, uh, the perception of most people is that New Fairfield High School athletics would be at this level, or your average high school is at this level in terms of the talent level. And now a Division III school would be here. You know, there's Western Connecticut, there's Eastern Connecticut, there's Wesley and there's Trinity. Then you have a Division II school is just a little bit better, and then it's Boston College and the other powerhouse D1s. That's people's frame of mind, okay? The reality is, here's New Fairfield High School, there is Eastern Connecticut, there's a Division II school and the Division I, just slightly better. The biggest jump you'll ever make is from high school to Division III. And people don't realize that. And many times people offend a college coach by saying stuff like, well, I don't know if my daughter could play at North Carolina for soccer, but at your school, you know, she could play for sure. And then the coach is going to say, have you seen us play? Have you seen the girl at your position, at your daughter's position? Well, no, but I just know. You don't know. You don't know until you get out there and see them play what the talent level is like. I'll never forget, 1987, I'm getting old. I drove from Long Island to Gettysburg to play football. I was trying to be all outgoing and, and meet the coaches. And I walked up in the gym and I said, Coach, how you doing? Wayne Mazzoni from Long Island. Coach, how you doing? Nice to meet you. And they were freshmen. They were the biggest, hairiest, hugest, 45-year-old looking dudes that I thought they were like 10-year coaches. I mean... They were freshmen. Everybody was team captain. Everybody was all county. Everybody was MVP. Everybody was a superstar. And that's Division Three. Okay? And, you know, generally, Mr. Pardalis, how long have you been here as a coach or AD? How many years? 35 years. Oh, okay, wow. That's a pretty good sample. As far as you know, in that 35 years, how many... Scholarship Division I athletes have been churned out, that, to the best of your knowledge, in 35 years. Division I scholarship athletes. Okay. Uh, how many Division Three athletes? More than 100, maybe? Yeah. Okay, that's every high school. That's every high school. It's not just New Fairfield. I mean, I, I ask at every school, it's the same thing. There are more Division Three schools, more people are going Division Three, uh, and it's still, don't make the mistake of thinking it's intramurals club sports. It's year-round, incredibly dedicated level of sports. Okay? Any questions on this piece of the puzzle before we move along? Yes. What's that? They're over there on the table. Yeah, all this stuff I sell here or we buy on a website, it's, you know... Yeah, they, a lot of, that company doesn't really market themselves terribly well, but college coaches use it to find everybody else's phone number and set up games, that type of thing. Yeah, I'll talk more about that stuff at the end. But. Um, so now you've got the right schools. You've gone through and done your homework, and you realize, I'll give you a perfect example, uh, you've dis determined that Lehigh, Lafayette, and Bucknell are three schools that would make a great fit for you. You play soccer at New Fairfield. You know you're the right fit. Academically, um, Athletically, it's a great school for you, except the, the coaches at those schools have no idea who you are. What are you going to do? First of all, you got to, as, as I said before, you have to match up the right. You can't, be a, you can't have a 2-1 GPA, have a 780 SAT, talk back to your coaches, and be lazy in the classroom, and are going to play at Bucknell. Okay? That's not going to happen. You can't, you know, if you want to be a lawyer... Generally, going to law school, getting that degree, passing the bar, that's what you need to do to be a lawyer. You can't you know, fail out of, a, out of a school and then be a lawyer. Okay? You want to play at, at Bucknell, you've got to meet the standards to get into Bucknell, athletically and academically. Then the next thing is, they have to evaluate you. Somehow, they have to know your name, they know that you're a person that exists at New Fairfield High School, and then they have to evaluate you. That is your goal. They may not want to recruit you. You may be terribly disappointed, but your goal is to be evaluated by those coaches. There's only three ways to do it. Be seen live, be seen by video, or get a reference that they trust to call on your behalf. And before I explain a little bit more about it, I'll give you, I'll turn it around now to make you guys a decision maker as opposed to trying to impress a decision maker as a coach. 
let's say uh, tomorrow night at your house you're going to have a party and you need a guy to play guitar for the party it's all invites are out it's catered all the people are coming everything's all set up and you hired a guy to play guitar but he just canceled on you and need to find somebody for tomorrow night and I say I play guitar I'm a coach and I do these talks I play guitar I'll be there tomorrow night I'm free I need two thousand dollars now though in a check who would who would give me the check right now what if I say but I really love the guitar I've been playing since I'm five I'm really good and I like to play different kinds of music I like Dave Matthews you know who would hire me now uh, what would I have to do to get you to give me some money for tomorrow night what's that play the guitar or if I don't have a guitar play a video of the guitar play an audio tape of the guitar or Mr. Pardalis, who everyone knows the athletic director and trusts him and is friendly with him he says listen Wayne was at our party two months ago he played he was absolutely incredible people have been calling us emailing us saying what a great time they had in Keno as a reference would that be make you more likely to hire me yeah that's the way it goes in life okay now you're flipping around you're trying to get that coach to evaluate you as an athlete they've either got to come to the high school here to see you play come to a summer league game or a tournament or a meet or event to see you you go to one of their camps you go to any tournament camp or something where that coach is going to be not just the big name camp where you may go have a good time but the coach you want to impress is not going to be there that's ideal is be seen live then you can be seen by video some coaches recruit completely off video will make decisions right off video some will get video and use it just to determine who they actually now want to go see live and in person okay and there's a variety of ways I used to talk in depth about the video I'll just say now anything's better than nothing you can have highlight tape you can have full game tapes you can have mom and pop fill the film you know with a digital camera or you can hire a company to film it and make it look nice like it's supposed to um, this film crew that's here the guy in the green jacket behind you he was trying not to, yeah he's Ben Talbot owns a company called Bird's Eye Sports and he went to Lehigh played football and baseball got drafted for baseball and now runs a company do, does filming and how I found about, out about him is I got videotapes about baseball players and I said this guy does the best, best job I've ever seen of anyone and I wound up calling him to say can you film me doing one of these talks because he's great at it okay so but again video you can hire somebody you can do it yourself if you have the money to make it look professionally done you're better off okay and then a reference that might be your high school coach it might not be it might be your athletic director it might be I get calls all the time as a college coach if I don't know that high school coach I'm not gonna I, I may trust what that coach says about the person's personality their character what kind of student they are I'm not gonna recruit somebody just based on a coach I've never heard of telling me somebody's good if I trust that coach and know that they've sent me three or four of their players over the last five years and now this coach says listen this kid at New Fairfield is tremendous you gotta check him out or you gotta recruit him get right on it so if you have the, the luxury of getting somebody that they trust to work on your behalf you gotta take advantage of that reference letters are a waste of everyone's time it's not even worth asking for one okay why would you think I would say a reference I'm talking athletically I'm not talking about admissions process or talking athletically why do you think they're a waste of time the what he got it right there they're all good the coach writes a letter and what does he do with it hands it to the kid to the parent he's not gonna write a mean letter or she's not gonna write it this kids lazy they don't show I mean it never happens every reference letter I've ever written read is is nice so on the phone they might tell you listen this kids tremendously talented but when things don't go great in the field you know you gotta watch out that's why we want to talk on the phone getting those letters and driving coaches and people crazy to get those letters it's not necessary for athletes okay uh, when should you do this when should you be actively trying to get college coaches to know about you um, my best answer is I have two boys they're two years old and four years old I'm already having Ben film them so I could send it to coach I mean the earlier the better ninth grade tenth grade is perfect junior year is the right time senior year is late but not too late I mean now is would be like the latest senior year that you could get someone um, to market somebody it's really almost too late but depends on the sport and the reason I say that and I don't try to freak people out or stress you out that my god my son's in 10th grade or 11th grade and I haven't done anything for him yet the fact is when I go if I was to watch a baseball game here at New Fairfield am I more interested in 
a mediocre senior athlete who's ready to go to college, or would I be more interested in a superstar, hustling, talented freshman center fielder? The talented player. When coaches go to camps and go to recruit or do these things, they're looking for talented players. We'll figure out how old they are later. If the kid's a ninth grader, he's going to graduate 2010, we just contact him when it's time. So if you feel ready to go to a camp, to send out a video, to get a coach to know about you, it's never really too early. Gino Oriema, the women's basketball coach at UConn, uh, a couple months ago got a verbal commitment from a ninth grade point guard in California. That's how crazy that level of, of recruiting is. Okay? Um, and then you need to follow up. You go to camps or you send out videos or to Bucknell, Lafayette, Lehigh, and they don't call you back. Hopefully they just start recruiting you two days later. That's the ideal situation. But if they don't call you back, you need to find out maybe they don't need your position. They don't think you're good enough. You can't get into the school. You should find out why. If, the, if five coaches tell you, listen, you can't play field hockey at the Division I level. You'll be tremendously disappointed, and you could again try to walk on, or you could say, you know what, there's a lot of great Division II and III schools, I could get a great education and still and play, and refocus your search. Okay? But you've got to follow up and find out what they think. All right? um, two quick things, and we'll move on from this. Is I always get asked, how do I know what, what camps, or what tournaments, or, or what a coach wants in this particular sport? The answer is call them. Email them. Call the coach at Lehigh and say, listen, I know you get bombarded all the time with this stuff, but my daughter's really interested in going to Lehigh. What do you want? Do you want video? How do you want the video shot? Do you want them to come to a camp? Where do you go in the summer to look for players? Uh, what meets? What events? To find out right from that source where you should go. I know a ton of football players that go to Boston College football camp. Great. Great facilities. Great school. Great coaches there. But if you want to play football at uh, Johns Hopkins those coaches don't go there. You need to go where the Johns Hopkins football coaches go to get seen by them to get recruited. Okay? So take it, get it right from the horse's mouth, find out what they do and what they want, and try to do the same things. Okay? Recruiting services. Most of them are a complete waste of your time and money. It's the, it's the same as an employment agency in the world of work. Employment agencies, do they really care about finding you a job that's going to make you happy? Parents? No, what do they want? Your commit they want commission to place you in a job. Okay? Many recruiting services just want your money and, and in fact can hurt you because what happens is as a college coach I get information from these services all the time. And I and when I say I, I'm talking about all college coaches. I interviewed a lot of coaches to write these books I write. I don't just take what I do. And um, I coach at Sacred Heart. I know where we get our kids, I know the kind of talent level they have, I know the kind of academics, I know the geographic range where they come from. So when I get information from a service about kids from Mississippi and Kansas and Louisiana, I know they're not coming to Sacred Heart. When they have SATs of 700 and 800 and 850, they can't get in. If they have SATs of 1450, 500, you know, 1500, they're not coming to Sacred Heart. If they throw 92, 93 miles an hour, they're too good for Sacred Heart. And if they throw 68 miles an hour, they're not good enough. So when I get a thousand pieces of information and none of them make sense for the school, what do I do with the whole pile? From the mailbox to the garbage. Mailbox, garbage, mailbox, garbage. And now you've paid two grand and sit back and say, this company's doing everything for me and your stuff's getting thrown in the garbage. Okay? The only company, there's one company that I know of that I trust as a coach because I use them and I know other coaches that use them and I won't announce it because it's illegal for me to broadcast and endorse a company. If you have an interest in knowing which one it is, send me an email and I'll tell you who it is at another time. Okay? Because they do a good job because they match up the right kids with the right schools and therefore coaches trust them and actually look at the information. Okay? Any questions on this piece? Again, we'll take questions at the end to the group and individually. But is there anything that anyone would like to know about this? Okay. This now I consider, I consider the first half what we covered. How to find the right places and how to get the coaches at those places to know about you and start recruiting you. The second half of this assumes you're either being recruited already when you walked in the door here, you're already getting called once a week and getting recruited, or you do some of the things that I talked about and the recruiting process starts. Okay? You have a whole set of things now to, to consider. 
The first is the, is the NCA issues. Now, there are uh, literally is a book this thick of NCA recruiting rules that every college coach must pass the test on yearly before they can recruit. So it's not your job to know when a live period is or a dead period or all these particular things. Don't worry about it. The recruiting rule you need to know is if you're being heavily recruited and someone wants to offer you an official visit, that means they're going to pay for your visit. Flight, train, car, hotel, meals, uh, tickets. If you're you know, an athlete they want and they're going to pay for your visit, you're only allowed five of those kind of official paid visits across all the different sports. If you're a three sport star here, you don't get five in each sport, you get five total. And you can only go to each school once. Okay? You can't go to Boston College three times on an official visit. You can go there once. And then if you want to pay your own way, unofficial visit, you can go to as many schools as you want, as many times as you want. Okay? The other recruiting rule, which I didn't put up here because it's not even worth you knowing, but I, but I will mention it, is there is a rule that says a college coach is not allowed to initiate the contact of an athlete, start recruiting them until July 1st of their, going into their senior year. And it's, I, I call it the LeBron James rule. If there was someone at this high school in 10th grade or 11th grade that was so incredibly good and there was no rules of when a college coach could t contact this person and it was LeBron James at New Fairfield, what would it be like for that kid at the school? It would just be crazy. I mean, there would be coaches sleeping in a hallway, coaches outside his classroom, coaches at his house. It would be just overwhelming. Okay? The way around that rule is, if you're ready to contact the coach, you can initiate the process anytime after ninth grade. In, in ninth grade, ninth grade and on. You can call, you can go to camps, you can uh, go visit, you can initiate the process. But if you say to yourself, I'm, I'm not ready, I don't want to talk to a coach yet, they can't bother you until July 1st going into your senior year. Okay? The next thing you have to be concerned with is the NCA clearinghouse. And I'm, this confuses a lot of people, this can become a hot topic, but it's it's really quite simple, okay? And I'm going to try to explain it pretty well. And you've got a sheet on it. Everyone has one sheet, um, one page handout on it. For Division I, it is a sliding scale based on your GPA and your SATs. And the scale is on that piece of paper. If you have above a, th a 3, 5, and above, you need as low as a 400 on the SAT. That's the math and verbal. That's what you get when you sign up. So you're in if you have a 3, 5, and ab above. And if your GPA is low as a 2.0, you need as high as a 10.10. And then it just there's the scale on your sheet of paper. I don't put it on the overhead because you wouldn't be able to see it. Okay. Now that is your core GPA. It's not your overall GPA. It's not what you get in psychology. It's not what you get in gym. It's not what you get in health. It's what you get in the courses that New Fairfield has determined count as the core courses. If you want to know what that is, you go to the NCA.org. You go to the clearinghouse, you put in New Fairfield's SAT code, and it shows which courses here at New Fairfield count towards the core courses. So you could have a 3.6 GPA and have a 3.0 core GPA. Math, English, Science, Social Studies. Okay? In Division two, is not a sliding scale. You need a 2.0 and an 8.20. If you have above that, you're eligible. Okay? Division three, there is no clearinghouse. But if you say, you know what, I'm definitely going to Wesley and I'm definitely going to Amherst or Williams or Middlebury, I say apply for the clearinghouse anyway. So just at the last minute, Stonehill comes along or one of these other schools comes along and recruits you, you're in the system. Uh, just anyone who th thinks they're going to play in college, after your junior year, grades are in. Go to the website, register for the clearinghouse, and then they will notify the guidance department. Guidance will send in a transcript. You can't get fully certified until your senior year grades are in. Okay, you have to meet a certain amount of actual credits of English, for example. So if you think my grades are great, I don't have to worry about English, I'm going to get senioritis, the second semester senior year, I'm, just, I'm going to fail it, I don't really care, you're in trouble. Do not coast if you're an athlete. Okay? If you don't meet these requirements, it should be listed on your paper there, you would be a partial qualifier. You could practice with the team and not play games as a freshman. You would still have four years of eligibility. If you're a non-qualifier, meaning you have under the required GPA and SAT, 
then you would not be able to practice with the team or play games, but assuming you did the coursework as a freshman in college, you would then have four years of eligibility left. The big part that most high schools do wrong with this clearinghouse is that they, they get so stressed out about this because there's always a horror story from somewhere about somebody who was all a great athlete and then mismanaged this piece and is now ineligible. So they do an hour-long presentation on this, and it is important, but no one knows what to do to get recruited. Everybody's certified, but no one's calling them. Okay? So this is a piece of the puzzle. It's not the only piece of the puzzle. Okay? And that sheet that you got it will go a long way to explaining everything. You can always email me or talk to your guidance counselor to get more information about it or ask me a question on it after. Okay? It's important that you understand that there is something called the clearinghouse, and if you want to play Division I or II, you need to meet certain grades to be able to play as a freshman. The next thing is once coaches are recruiting you, calling you once a week, bringing you up for visits, it is now your, your I don't know, your right to ask questions of the coach. Many kids are shy and don't want to talk to the college coach. They didn't get any attention and all of a sudden now Villanova is calling once a week and they say, oh my, I'm just so excited to be recruited by Villanova that you know, they're not going to ask a question because I don't want to offend the Villanova coach. The more they're showing an interest in you, the more questions you should ask. Okay? And I relate it again back to the job search. Um, if you're being interviewed by a company and you walk in for your first interview and they say, you know, how, did, uh, how was your trip here? Do you have a nice, you know, can I get you a drink of water, have a seat? And you say, excuse me, um, what do you guys pay and how much vacation time do I get? Are you going to get that job? No. Okay. You don't bombard a coach right away with questions. The more interest they show you, the more you can ask. And I've, I've broken it down to four basic categories here to try to explain it. And in my book, I've, I've got a whole chapter's worth of questions because some things may hit home more for other people. So academically, um, do athletes get pre-registration? Will my son or daughter be able to sign up, get the classes at the right times that they want so that they don't interfere with practice or games? If they're getting a scholarship offer and they don't perform in the classroom, will they lose scholarship money? Can I be any major and still play a sport? Certain coaches will tell you, listen, you want to play ice hockey here? That's great, but you're not going to be a pre-med major because you're going to have three afternoon labs and now you're never going to be able to practice. So be a doctor or score some goals, but you can't do both. Okay? Yeah, my God, you'd want to know that ahead of time. Okay? Are there tutors? You know, we're going to practice a lot, play a lot. Uh, are there tutors to help me if, I'm, if my grades suffer? Coaching. It is your right to find out what the coach is like. A coach is going to be very nice in their office during a 20-minute interview when you go visit the school. Are they going to scream at you and yell at you during that time when you go visit the college? No. They're going to be nice. They're going to want to recruit you. Could, are there bad coaches or are there coaches that wouldn't be right for you? Of course. How are you going to find out what that coach is really like? Go to a game. Ask the players. Absolutely. Don't get suckered into think, oh, that's a great coach. I love them. I, I met them for 20 minutes, and that's where I'm going to send Mike. They could be great. They may not be great. Find out what the assistant coaches are like. The head coach may take another job. Find out what their coaching philosophy is like. I mean, literally, if you're a quarterback, find out what kind of offense they run or what kind of defense. You should know how you might be used in their scheme if it makes a fit for you. Okay? Recruiting. This boils down to finding out what they really want, you know. They should be able to tell you why they're recruiting you. In other words, um, we saw you swim at the meet against Bethel, and the way you, you, know, you swam that day was just tremendous. We're graduating three people that, that swim your event, and we really think you can come in and, and be the number one person in that event. That, that's being shown interest. Or they may tell you, listen, we think you could be on the team. We think you'll, you'll make the team, but we probably don't see you playing for a couple of years. It, you know, you could still choose to go there, but you should be told why you're being recruited. We think you could be a conference starter, or we think it's going to take a lot of work for you to play here, but you should be told where, what they think your status is for that, that program, so that you can make an educated opinion on which school may be right for you. Okay? Um, you should ask how many kids on the team play your position, how many other kids on the team who don't play your position might be switched into your position, 
and maybe how many coaches, how many players the coach is recruiting at your position or may want to bring in. You might look at the roster and say, look, two senior point guards, they're graduating. I'm going to go there because I'm going to play point guard. When they're going to switch two forwards to play point guard and they're going to bring in three new ones. And now you get there first day and you thought it was going to be you and it's now five point guards. Okay? Philosophy. I, I boil this down to, is there a JV team, you know? Are you going to make varsity or if you don't make varsity, you don't play anymore? Is there a JV team? Do they redshirt their freshmen? Meaning you don't play as a freshman, you come back and play as a fifth year senior when you're bigger and stronger and faster and more able to be adjusted to college and know the, the system of the, of the sport. Um, who washes the uniforms? Is there a strength and conditioning coach? Do we have to fundraise for travel? Um, is it a year round program? How do we travel? Do we travel by plane? Do we travel by buses with professional drivers in these beautiful buses? Or, as many schools do, do we travel by van? Being driven by a coach who is mad he just lost the game or she lost the game in a van that's got like, you know, nine million miles on it. Okay? That would be the number one thing as a parent now I would ask. Because I read the NCA news and the NCA is trying to get away from coaches driving vans but some schools can't afford it and yearly there's vans that break down, there's vans that have accidents and there's people that die in vans every year. I mean it's just reality. You're, you know, you're, you're coaching in Utah, you drive seven hours to a track meet and now that coach has got to drive back in the middle of the night, everyone's sleeping in the van, they fall asleep, problem with the van. That's reality. Okay, so there's a lot of things you should ask. What time's practice? You just assume, you know, we practice after school because that's what I've done four years in high school. When you get there and you find out that they practice 10 o'clock at night because that's the time they can get the ice, that's the time they can get the field, that's the time the coach is free. Coach is a night person. Coach is a morning person. Practice are at 5.30. Ask ahead of time. If you're down, narrowing down between three schools and one practice at 3 o'clock and the other one practice at 5.30 in the morning, maybe that makes your decision. Okay? It's your right to ask these questions. And again, it makes you more interesting because now when a coach says, you know, they told you about their school and about their program and they say, listen, you have any questions? And you have none, okay, goodbye. You have a few questions, you get some conversation going, and that makes you more interesting, okay? We really have two more pieces to cover. And it's admissions, okay? These six pieces here are really what admissions the uh, counselors at schools I've worked have told me what they're looking for when they read applications and accept or deny students. So, you know, your high school guidance department could probably help you a lot better than I could about advising on how to get into a school. The only thing I can tell you about is what a coach can do. Okay? And I answer it in three ways. Number one is, if a coach has been there a long time, wins a whole lot of games, has games on TV, makes over a million dollars, goes to bowl games, you know, big time sports, that coach is admissions. You know, like Joe Paterno, who's been there a long time at Penn State, he has a button on his phone, it's, it probably says A, and he, he picks up the phone, he hits A, it goes to admissions, and he says, hey, we got a new linebacker, goodbye. You know, he just does what he wants, I mean, I would think. I hope he doesn't see this someday and call me, but, you know, Bobby Knight, uh, Randy Edsel, Jim Calhoun, these... these these guys, it's pro sports at that level. It's pro sports. They do what they want. Okay? Many coaches will tell you, if you're a recruited athlete, it is worth 0.5 GPA points and 200 SAT points. So if the school's average is 3.5 and 1,200 in their incoming freshman class, and you have a 3.0 and 1,000, now their interest is going to help you get in there. That's a generic way to answer it for a recruited athlete. The reality for me is I've been coaching in all the, the different schools I've been. I find somebody I like, I get their transcript. I give the transcript right to admissions. Admissions tells me one of three things. Yes, this person can get in for sure, in which case I continue to recruit them because I've been told that they can get in. That's pretty easy. Admissions may say, under no circumstances are we letting this knucklehead in. They don't say that. But, and I say, well, what if their dad donates you know, $100 million for a new building? They say, even then, they're not going to get in. And I just say to this person, I'm sorry, you know, can't get you in. Good luck somewhere else. Okay? Sometimes in that situation, I will actually call another coach on their behalf and say, listen, here's a great kid. If you can get him in, it's worth, worth your time. 
And then you have that mid-level. Admissions will say maybe. And they might be saying maybe because they want to see who else from New Fairfield is going to apply. They may want to see who else applies in the whole application pool before they're going to decide. Or many times I get told, listen, let's see how they do after their first part of their senior year. Let's see how they do in those courses, the AP courses or honor courses. Let's see how the, what those grades come back. If those grades come back good, we're going to let them in. But you don't know, and they're, they're, they're saying maybe. And now it's October, just about to be uh, November. We need an answer. So as most coaches will get three, five, eight spots or slots that they can guarantee the admission. Okay? And generally what they do is coaches are going to rank their players, call up the first one and say, listen, you're borderline getting into school. If you would commit to the college right now and, tell, and maybe have to apply early decision, we can guarantee you get in. If the person says yes, spot number one is gone, you go to the next person. If they tell you, you know, I'm, I can't decide yet, I'm still waiting to hear from other colleges, you say, listen, you're a great player, we're still interested in you, we'll put you lower on the list, but we no longer can guarantee your admission. If you get in and you want to come, we can talk about it then. Okay? And it, this conversation happens all the time. It happens, I mean, in, in August we have these conversations. I don't want to spend a year recruiting somebody who we, I can't get in, and I don't think you want to get all pumped up on Bucknell and you can't get in. So this conversation is going to happen pretty early. And if you should ask a coach, hey, coach, can I get in? How does my application look? I'm really interested in the school, but I really have to know I, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. Where do you stand on that? Okay? And if they say they can guarantee that you can get, they can get you in, then you could ask for it in writing. So that it's not just a verbal thing and then they back off of that. Say, I'd like to have that in writing. And they can send that to you. Or admissions can send you a letter. Okay? Any questions about that with admissions? This is especially big in the Ivy League schools, in the Division III schools where they don't have scholarships. Okay, Division I and II has scholarships, three does not. But certain Division I conferences like the Ivy League and Patriot League don't have scholarships. So many times this is the coach's chip to play in recruiting. In other words, if you're coaching at Yale and you're recruiting a kid who may take a scholarship at Duke or North Carolina and you can't give out a scholarship, you could say, listen, I can get you into Yale. I can guarantee you get in. So this is a big piece to some of those schools who can't give you a scholarship. This is what they can give you. Okay. Um, the next piece of the puzzle, this is scholarships. It's really financial aid, but it's, um, hopefully you can see it from where you're sitting. This is the NCAA maximum amount of scholarships allowed in the, it, women's sports. Division one is on the left and two is on the right. And I'm going to explain a whole bunch about this because it's very confusing. Okay. Let's take basketball for Division Two. So uh, Pace University, Division Two. The women's basketball coach has 10 scholarships. If Pace costs $30,000, that coach has a budget of $300,000 for scholarships. Per year or per team? Good question. Not per year, per the whole team. So that's a few seniors, a couple of juniors, a few sophomores, a few freshmen. The seniors graduate. They get their money back. They give it to the new class of recruits. Great question. Okay. The coach can do whatever they want to spend that money. They can give it to 10 girls, give 10 girls $30,000 each, or give 20 girls $15,000 each, whatever they want. As long as you add up the number of players times what they're getting, can't exceed $300,000 at that particular school. If their tuition was $40,000, they can't spend more than $400,000. Okay? Scholarships are not four-year deals. They are one-year renewable. Okay? Generally, a coach is not going to take a scholarship away based on your on-field, on-court you know, performance. They'll take it away based on your grades, take it away based on your behavior. You like punching people, showing up late, throwing kegs out windows, you're not going to keep a scholarship. If you stink as an athlete, it's their fault. They've misread you and they keep your money. If you get hurt, many coaches will have the financial aid department replace your athletic money with some other form of money so that they get their limited money of scholarship money back and now you get accounting money or engineering money that nobody's governing. Everyone's governing lacrosse and all field hockey and all that, but they're not covering academic money or other grants. Okay? 
Um, here's the number for the men. What's also important to realize about these, this is the maximum amount of scholarships allowed. And it's capped for one reason. It's a salary cap. Otherwise, you'd have the Yankees and the Royals. No offense, Yankee fans, but if they didn't cap scholarships at 13 for men, um, Michigan, who's just rolling in the dough athletically, why wouldn't they give out 100? They got the money. And now they'd play Sacred Heart, and Sacred Heart doesn't only have enough money to give out 13, and now they'd get killed because they can't pay. They can't afford it. Okay? But the reality is, and here's the wake-up call, many of you know this, but a lot of you don't, this is the maximum amount you're allowed. Most schools come nowhere near close to where they're allowed. So, golf, you're allowed 4.5. Most college Division I programs would give out what amounts to one scholarship. Why would they not give out 4.5? Don't have the money. They have a, the school has a limited amount of money, the professors like getting paid, the administrators like getting paid, they like building new buildings, and they say, golf, you get one and good luck. That coach could take the $30,000 and spread it around a bunch of players, give it to one great golfer, whatever they want. Okay? Many colleges tier their sports. This is the trend in the last 10 years. They, instead of each coach getting a little bit of money to spread around, certain sports at that school, they'll be fully, they'll have the max amount allowed. The other sports will have the same amount they always had, and other sports will get their money taken away. And now the thought is the athletic director says, let's win a conference or a national championship in these sports. Let's be win or lose some in these middle sports. These other sports, you're going to get pummeled. But we just want to offer the sport at the school. They want to be known for something. They want to be known for lacrosse or whatever the case is. So you'll wonder, why, why is that lacrosse program doing tremendously well and they can't win a swimming meet? That's probably why. Okay? There is no way to find out what each school has. No, unless you call and ask them. Um, if you want to know if you're a scholarship athlete, you know how you're going to know? They're going to call you all the time, they're going to bring you up for a visit, and they're going to make a scholarship offer to you. Okay? Um, sometimes you might be told, well, um, we'll give you a scholarship if you prove yourself when you're here. Some coaches do that. Some coaches don't give any money to freshmen. They'll give money if you prove yourself there. I'd ask kids on the team or parents of kids on the team if that's reality so you don't get suckered into it. Many coaches make a practice of giving uh, scholarships out to seniors who've spent three years working hard without any money. Um, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the big myth, I would think, in terms of that is like people ask me all the time, well I, heard, I was watching TV and Notre Dame said they had a walk-on who's now got a scholarship. And many people think, well some kid from New Fairfield, you know, just like showed up at Notre Dame and just went out and, you know, brought his cleats out and made the team. The reality is that they have 85 scholarships, which does seem like a lot, okay, but let's say they have 20 a year that they give out. They, did, they gave out all their scholarships, they still want this kicker. This kicker is being recruited all over the country. Notre Dame has no scholarship money left. And they say, listen, come on a team, come here first year, and, and you have to pay your own way. If you kick like we think you can, when we get a scholarship back for next year, we'll give you the money. That's called the recruited walk-on. That's not a dude who just showed up and kicked, you know, decided to go out for football and made the team and got a scholarship. Okay? The days of walk-ons are almost non-existent anymore because rosters are smaller for Title IX reasons and coaching is incredibly, recruiting is inc incredibly competitive. Coaches make this their practice. They, they spend, most coaches will start with a list of about 5,000 kids a year in advance. Shrink it down based on talent, based on kids looking at other places, all to get down to bringing in six, seven, eight kids a year or depending on the sport. I mean, baseball, we bring in seven kids a year. We start with about 2,000 names. Any questions about the scholarships? Yes? How do coaches view public school athletes compared to private school athletes? My best answer is we're looking for an athlete at any school. In any way. They're, they're sport, they're, they, they can have a great reputation for a great program. 
um, or they could have a, a terrible reputation for a certain athletic program. It doesn't, we just want athletes, wherever they come from. They're a post-grad, they go to a prep school, they go to a public school, doesn't matter. Just looking for good people, good athletes. Now, will certain high schools get a little bit more attention? Maybe because they're, they're successful in a particular sport? Probably, but the main reason for that is the more your win, the longer your season is. The longer your season is, the more likely coaches now end their college season and can come out and watch the playoffs of the high school. Most kids get more attention in the summertime, not because summer teams are more important than high school, just the fact that during the summertime, a college coach has nothing else to do but recruit. Run a couple of camps and recruit. Whereas during the school year, there's always something going on. Okay? So you should always play your high school sport, but you may get more looks in the summertime just based on a coach's schedule. Okay? All right, we'll get down to our last piece. This is, you know, some, pe some of you might be in, in ninth grade or have kids in ninth grade, and you don't really need my advice on how to make a decision on college three years from now, but I want to be complete in the topic. Um, the first three things are very generic, very silly, but the reality. If you're looking at three schools, all things being equal, I would make a choice of going to the better academic school or the cheaper school or the school where I'm wanted more as an athlete. All things being equal, I wouldn't pick a cheaper school that I don't like just because it's cheaper. I wouldn't pick a school where the coach wants me more just because he wants me or she wants me. All things being equal, I would go with academics or with cost or with where I'm wanted. The reality is you have to take visits and, make a, and test drive the college by visiting. By going up, meeting with someone on the team, going to her classes, going to the cafeteria, going to the dorms, go watch a practice or a game, go to a party, and literally take a look at that college before you make a decision. And most coaches want to offer that. That's why we have official visits. I don't want to recruit somebody as a coach for a full year, spend money on you, turn down other kids. It's a lot of time and effort. You show up three weeks into the school in September, you go, I don't like it here, I'm quitting, I'm going somewhere else. That's terrible for us. It's terrible for you. So you want to, you want to take advantage of that. You want to go look at the school and see everything about it before you make a decision. Okay? And I'm sure many parents wish they, before they committed to saying yes about a job offer they had, would love to have gone to the job for a few weeks or a couple of days before they decided if they liked the job, but you can't do that. But you can in college. Okay? And that's a must. And I know kids that have been completely confused and can't sleep at night go back for an official visit or for an overnight visit and now the decision is a piece of cake. Okay? I, I warn against going on an open house visit. I think open house is really best for non-athletes. Um, you want to really go where you can go with somebody from your area, maybe someone from uh, Fairfield County who's at Richmond, University of Richmond, and, or somebody who plays your position, and, and somebody you can pal around with and see the school from their perspective. Because that's the way you're going to be living it when, once you get there. Okay. Um, I'm going to make one last generic statement and then we'll take a few questions from the group, collect those forms, and then I'll, I'll meet with anyone individually. But I don't know what it's like at New Fairfield, but I say this everywhere. The growing trend of specialized athletes is a disaster. The specialization of the high school athlete is totally wrong. And kids are getting pressure from their travel coaches and their summer coaches to drop sports to play their primary sport year-round, and it's the biggest mistake you can make for a variety of reasons. Number one is, when you get to college, do you think you're going to specialize in your sport? Yep. Number two is, if you want to get better at your primary sport, you're going to get better by playing other sports. You're going to become a better athlete by playing other sports. There's only so much you can do your sport before you get burnt out and you just, how much can you practice your sport or play it year round? Okay? You want to become a better athlete, you got to play other sports. And then thirdly, the number one reason is, if you want to be good in college, it requires one key thing. I've seen as freshmen coming in, you want to figure out who's going to do well, what do you think it, the key factor is? In any sport. What's that? What'd you say? Dedication, partly. What made Michael Jordan good? Just love the competition. 
Love the competition. Already won championships, wants to win again. Why would he practice all the time? Why would, when he's rich and set for life, would he still come back and play? Compete. You learn to compete when you play sports. I, I'd rather watch a kid play high school football as a baseball coach than watch him play a fall baseball game in the middle of October. I'd rather watch to see, can you cover somebody, will you run down on kickoff coverage and go take somebody's head off and compete rather than just see you play a fall baseball game. And I know I speak for just about every coach. Now certain sports might be a little different, but most coaches feel that way, that they want to see you enjoy high school sports. When you get to college, it's more like a job. You should be enjoying your high school career. If you hate it, if you're playing basketball because your mom wants you to play or you've been talked into it but you hate it, I mean, quit. Sorry, mom, quit. If you are quitting basketball to focus more on lacrosse to play an indoor league, I think it's a shame, personally. Okay? And the thing about the prep schools I like is they have a three-sport requirement. And kids find out they get better at those sports, they, they enjoy it more, and you know they, they learn things that they may carry through the rest of their life playing other sports okay that's one person's take on the growing trend of specialized athletes in high school why don't we do about three or four or five questions in this group I'm sure there's got to be some questions just in general you can't be the first group ever with no questions so yes go ahead in the back yeah A letter of intent, the question was, what's the difference between a likely letter and a letter of intent? A letter of intent is actually a scholarship offer. A national letter of intent is when you get offered some piece of a scholarship. You sign a letter of intent, it means you're committing to that school that you're going to go there. It might be a $1,000 scholarship or a $40,000 scholarship. A likely letter means that you're likely to be accepted to the school. It's not any bound, it's not, it's not binding, it's the school saying it's likely that you're going to get accepted here. Totally two to separate things. Any other questions? Yeah, right here. Excellent question. If you want to visit the school as an athlete, should you contact the coach prior to the visit? I say this, um, if you're just checking out colleges, like really early and you don't really know what you want, and that's my, again, as I start off, go visit some schools. I would go there to visit the school and I would just drive around and I wouldn't talk to anybody on my first visit. If you know then you like it and you want to go back, then I would call the coach for a visit. Yeah, a coach might say, the question was, can you just call a coach out of the blue? Certain coaches will say, you know, happy to meet with you. Other coaches will say, we need to talk to somebody before we can meet with you. We need to see video, we need to see you play. Some you'll never get them in person anyway, uh, depending on big time coaches. Everyone is a little bit different in that, in that regard. But if you're traveling to a school and you might not be able to get back to Cal Berkeley, and you're going to fly out to California, and you can't, you know, would I try to meet with the coach in that trip? Yes. But I think it's, it doesn't make sense to go to a school, meet with the coach for an hour, get toured around, and you hate the place. You know, so I always say, if you can visit a school, you know, go up to Babson, drive two hours, go visit Babson and hit five of the schools in the, in the Boston area, and you know you love Babson, and then, you know, call up the coach, say, listen, I came to campus, I really checked it out, I really like it, now I'd like to come back and make more of a formal visit, can I do that? Yes? The question was, can you show a college coach that you got another offer? Um, when I was talking about comparing packages, I was mostly talking about the overall financial aid picture. But can you, play, can you increase a, an offer by playing one school against the other? Yes. Are you very, could you be at risk of losing the original offer? Possibly. It's the, I don't know if you've ever done this in your job. You're getting a salary. Um, and either you want to get more money so you tell them about another company or you actually interview at another place, they want to hire you and you tell your company about it and now they either match the other company or they increase your offer, you know, your salary. Or what could they say? See you later, man. 
I, I, I gave a kid once an offer about five years ago, a $5,000 scholarship for baseball, and he called me back and says, this other school gave me a full ride. I said, hey, good luck, man. That's, that's what I said, good luck, that's great. And then he called me back two weeks later, and then he was lying. I mean, he was lying. And I said, you know, if that school's going to offer that kid a full ride, they're crazy. Maybe they see something I don't. So, but, but it can happen. And you, can, you could show somebody the actual offer or tell them what the offer is, but I really wouldn't lie because coaching's kind of a small world and they're going to see each other at a convention or a tournament or a camp and say, you gave that kid from New Fairfield 25, what are you? And the coach can go, I never heard of him. And now, you, you know, I would be wary of that, but... If you know you want to go to a particular school and the offer is not enough, you can say, listen, I, I really like the school. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I really need some more money. Is there a, what, what can you do to get me some more money? That can happen. Yeah. You're going to know when the time is right to do that. Again, you're going to know a, a scholarship. A scholarship is going to be brought up when the coach wants you to make a decision. So right after a scholarship is being brought up, they're making you an offer to say, here, we're going to offer you $5,000. We'd like you to come to school. So once they make that offer, you're going to make a decision in a couple of weeks. I wouldn't drive up to a school in July and go visit with the, co visit with the coach and he doesn't know really who you are and you're going to say, you know, is, what are you going to give me for a scholarship? Yeah. Yes? A school like Boston College, they definitely probably use their 85, get their 85. Oh, yeah. For football. Oh, yeah. Does that mean they probably get their full girls swimming maximum? Good question. The question was if, if BC, Boston College, gets 85 football scholarships, and they do, you don't get ranked without it, and would that mean that they would get, you mean men swimming or women swimming? Women's, like they just moved to the ACC and their girls swimming is not like their football team. You, you, you have a couple things. You have Title IX issues, which is equal opportunity for men and women, but it doesn't mean the sports have to be equal. They could just it's equal opportunities. Okay? Um, my guess is, if you're asking me specifically about Boston College, my guess is they're fully funded in every sport because it's huge athletics there. Even though it's like such a different, like they swim against Division three schools. Um, if they're not in, an AC, in the ACC for swimming? Well, they have to be. Right. But they don't have to be in the ACC for swimming, but... But will they go to the ACC like at the end of the year? Yeah. Will they swim their schedule against Division three schools? All of their schedule? No, but they're not a level... They're not a... I wouldn't want to speak for that school not really knowing, but I would think a Boston College and a UConn and Syracuse and those Rutgers, they're fully funded in everything. That's a, that's a major college sport. Whereas you take Quinnipiac, Fairfield, Central, University of Hartford, and they're probably not fully funded in any, almost any sport. It's just a different world. Actually, I would take that back. They're probably fully funded in basketball. And if you know anything about Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac hockey, anyone know about Quinnipiac hockey? They're awesome. They're fully funded. They're going to play Michigan, and they're going to play everybody. So, yes. Early decision is only for those kids. You should ask your guidance person; they could give you better advice. But only early decision is only for when you know you're gonna need that, want to go to that school, and you really need to apply early to to get in. You are bound to it once that happens, and if you don't get in, will you still have opportunity to get in elsewhere? Yes, but it's. I hate to give advice on that because it's like kids say to me, well, coach, I, I'm trying to choose between going to a bigger program where I can't play right away and a Division three program where I could play right away. What's right? I don't know. Everybody's different. All right, let's do one last question, and then uh, we'll have, uh, have you hand in those feedback forms if you could. Is there any last question that someone would like to ask to the group? Yes. The question was at these college recruiting showcases, does it make sense to go to them to maybe get exposure from schools that you didn't know about? Or That makes some sense. I think it's much better to, 
take the, the, do the homework ahead of time, find the right schools, and then do whatever you can to get those coaches to, to know about you. I mean, most of the times, um, if you've never heard of that school or that program or the coach, more than likely it may not be a fit for you. So you should select which showcases and which places to go to, I think based off of knowing which coaches are going to be there. But if someone's in 10th grade and has no idea, hey, plunk down your money, go to it, and maybe it'll, it'll work out in the long run. You really can't get hurt by getting more exposure in those camps. Okay. Uh, lastly, I try not to be Donald Trump and hawk my stuff, but I wrote a few books, so I think they're halfway decent. I've got a book on the recruiting process, kind of what I covered tonight in a lot of detail. Um, that college CD, a couple of motivational books, and then a few things for, uh, for baseball players. Um, and this is what I will give out to anybody. If we, uh, this will be the winning. I used to sell this and no one wanted to buy them, so now I give them away to get them out of my car because my golf clubs are about to roll into them and dent them. So, if you hand those feedback forms in, Mr. Pardell will pick one out and you'll take home a poster. Okay? Thank you guys very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll be up here and answer any questions if you have them. Thank you.